Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about the prokaryotic cell. Now chapter four is going to be broken up into uh, the prokaryotic cell and uh, for my CCP students, the eukaryotic cell as well. For my Camden County students, the eukaryotic cell will be found under chapter five of your textbook. Okay. Um, so this particular lecture is just going to focus on the prokaryotic cell and this is probably something that you briefly touched on in one of your earlier courses. And they probably told you that the prokaryotic cell lacks a nucleus and that it does not contain enemy membrane bound organelles. Um, and then you moved on to the eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cell should be more of a review for you guys as there's really nothing new here uh, besides what you've already been taught. Um, but the reason why we go into the prokaryotic cell is because that's what bacteria are. Bacteria are prokaryotic cells. Um, now some key differences are gonna be the way that their DNA is packaged. Um, prokaryotic cells such as bacteria and archaea will not have any um, chromosomes within a nucleus, okay? Rather, the chromosomes and all nuclear material uh, is actually just free within the cytoplasm versus the eukaryotes, which will have a nucleus, which is a separate uh, enclosed structure. The other thing is that bacteria will also have a cell wall. Okay, Now, there are eukaryotes that will also have a cell wall. Remember from chapter one lecture, I briefly mentioned that the one cell type that does not have cell walls are animal cells, which do include human cells. The animal cells um, are eukaryotes, but they lack a cell wall. Now, just because bacteria have a cell wall, they will still have a phospholipid membrane all living cells will have a phospholipid membrane, which is also called a cell membrane or plasma membrane. So the cell wall in bacteria is made up of peptidoglycan. We did see that term in chapter one. If you break this word down, peptide means proteins, glycan means sugars, okay? The archaea will have cell walls that are distinct from bacteria and both and eukaryotes as well. Looking at internal structures, uh, bacteria and archaea will have no membrane bound organelles whatsoever. Okay, so there's gonna be no ER, no Golgi, no lysosome, no peroxisomes, and as we just discussed, no nucleus as well. So here's a general uh, image of a prokaryotic cell. Um, you do wanna familiarize yourself with this image as you may see it on an exam. Um, make sure that you are able to identify all of these structures, okay? Um, you probably are familiar with the image of the eukaryotic cell uh, and all the organelle structures. Uh, so this is its counterpart. And we're going to go through each of these structures uh, individually in a few moments. I do also like this picture because you do need to know all the structures that can make up a bacterial cell or a prokaryotic cell. And not only is this identifying those structures, but it actually has a nice little description of what each of those structures is responsible for. So this is actually a great slide uh, to study from. Okay, because not only does it list the structures, but it also gives you a very nice um, description of all of those structures. So bacteria are single-celled organisms. Uh, bacteria cells are capable of carrying out all necessary life functions. They will undergo reproduction. They do have metabolic pathways. And actually most of those metabolic pathways are very much conserved with the same pathways that you have. They will process nutrients. 
uh, most bacteria are heterotrophs, which means that they do have to uh, ingest carbon-based materials in order to survive. Bacteria can also function in groups, although they are single-celled organisms. They can behave in communities or live within communities. And those communities tend to be defined as either a colony or a biofilm. Um, as we mentioned with the microscopy portion of chapter three, uh, bacteria are small. Uh, the average size is about one micron in diameter. That's something you should be aware of. Um, this is about 10 times smaller than the typical eukaryotic cell. Typical eukaryotic cell is about 10 microns in diameter. Okay. Um, so most bacteria are going to sort of, you know, range within that one micron range there. The fact that it is within the one micron range here does allow us to be able to see these things under a standard light microscope. Bacterial shapes. There are three general shapes that we're going to be concerned with. The first is cocci. Cocci are circles, spheres, ovals, bean-shaped, and pointed. Bacillus. These are cylindrical, filamentous, or club-shaped bacteria. And then vibrios would be anything that has a curve, kink, or spiral shape to it. You do want to familiarize yourself with these names, okay? Some of the labs will ask you, what is the shape of the bacteria? I don't want you to tell me that it's a circle, oval, or sphere. I want you to use the correct term of a cocci, or bacilli, or vibrio. So here are some examples of the cocci, here are some examples of the bacilli, and here are some examples of the vibrios, just so you can get a little bit of perspective on the actual shapes. And then here are some of our, these technically would fall under the vibrio category, um, but they are more spiral shaped, okay? And if they are larger and thicker, we call them spirillums. If they are tiny and spiral shaped or corkscrew shaped, we call those spirochetes. If you notice the difference in the magnification here, these are about two times. Uh, these are about uh, twice, the, sorry, the spirillums are about twice as large as the spirochetes. Okay. Um, some other terms that I want to just point out. Uh, Diplo will refer to a pair. Uh, tetrads is groups of four. Staph is a cluster uh, or an irregular cluster. There's no real um, arrangement or, uh, you know, particular number or set to that. Strepto is a chain, okay? So we've seen this one before, staphylococci. So just by its name, you should know what you're looking at underneath the microscope. Staph means clusters, cocci means circles. So if you were to look underneath the microscope at staphylococci, it would be expected that you would see clusters of circles. Now, if you did not know this was a staphylococci and you saw clusters of circles underneath the microscope, you might think maybe I'm dealing with a staphylococci. If you saw a chain of circles, maybe it's a streptococci. Okay. All right. Um, Next up will be some external structures. These are structures that can be found on the outside of the cell. Okay, so the um, external structures, sorry. The external structures, uh, there's several different groups that can exist, and we call these appendages. Um, these would include flagella or axial filaments. The main function of flagella or axial filaments is to provide motility for the cell. This would actually move the cell in its environment. We then have fimbri and pili. These will provide attachment points or channels uh, it, with the pili uh, for communication between cells. Thank <laughs> you. 
So if you look, here is a picture of a flagella. And here we can see that the flagella is actually anchored in the plasma membrane, the cell wall, and this particular bacteria also has an outer membrane. So it's actually anchored into all three layers of the cell uh, coverings here. Um, <clears throat> and what you see is you have this hook, filaments, and this is sort of the basal body, which is sort of the motor that's going to cause this filament to sort of spin around. And if you look at this picture here, you can see the bacterial cell and you can see the flagella right here. And what will happen is the flagella will actually um, sort of rotate and the cell will move. Now the flagella arrangements can either be uh, monotrichous, which means you have a single flagellum, uh, lophotrichous, which means you have a bunch of flagella coming off at a single point of origin, amphitrichous, which means the flagella are located on either side of the cell, and then peritrichous, where the flagella are located at multiple points of origin around the cell. This is really what's sort of giving polarity to these cells. Um, a particular bacteria would sort of uh, rotate in a tumbleweed fashion with these flagella here. So you'd sort of see this little spiraling uh, across the uh, area. Now, bacteria are going to move uh, in response to either some type of chemical signal or light stimulus. Uh, if it moves in response to a chemical stimulus, it's referred to as chemotaxis. Um, this is going to uh, either be a positive or negative effect. If the bacterial cell is moving towards the chemical stimulus, then it is referred to as a positive chemotaxis. If it is moving away from the chemical stimulus, then it is referred to as a negative chemotaxis. Movement towards or away from light would be referred to as phototaxis. We then have what are called pleriplasmic flagella. <clears throat> these are a little bit different structurally. Uh, these particular axial filaments are actually embedded within the wall of the cell here. And we typically see these uh, flagella located as part of the uh, spiral shaped bacteria. And as you can see here, uh, we see the flagella sort of wrap around this cell, okay? And what's gonna happen is these flagella will sort of contract up and the cell will sort of corkscrew up and then it will create tension within a spring. And then when it releases, you can just picture putting tension on a spring when you release it, it's going to fling uh, across the space. Um, and that's sort of what you're seeing with these periplasmic uh, flagella here. Um, appendages for attachment and mating. Uh, attachment can enhance, enhance the pathogenicity in some bacteria. The ability to be able to stick to a surface could actually prove to be pathogenic for that organism. An example is picture a bacteria that invades the bladder. Now the wall of the bladder, um, where we know we can get infections, uh, we end up with UTIs, that, that is something that can occur. But if you're a bacteria within the wall of the bladder, you run into a little bit of a problem. And the problem is, is that when the uh, individual voids their urine or urinates, uh, you will most likely be washed out unless you are actually adhering to the surface of the bladder. And we find that a bacteria such as E. coli have these attachment proteins uh, called fimbrae, which will attach to the surface of the bladder cells. So that when you undergo the process of urination, what happens is the bladder I'm sorry, the bacteria won't get washed away. Okay, it's, it's firmly attached to the cell. As you can see here, uh, we have these fimbrae. These are proteins on the surface of the cell here. Uh, and they will actually interact with proteins either on a host cell, as you can see down here in the gray image, or actually with other fimbrae of other cells, as you can see here in the top image. Uh, so when we saw, you know, terms like staph, which means cluster of bacteria. So if you had staphylobacilli or staphylococci, you would have a bunch of bacteria that are stuck to each other. 
and that would be because of these attachment proteins. Now the pillus is a little bit different. Uh, the pili, uh, these are also known as sex pili. Uh, what they are, these are tubular channels or structures from one cell to another cell, okay? And what happens is you have, um, let's say a plasmid or a piece of DNA in this cell will get transferred to this cell, okay? So they can share uh, what's called plasma DNA back and forth. We'll talk about plasma DNA in a little bit. So essentially what happens is the DNA from this cell will replicate and a copy of that DNA will travel through a sex pillus to this cell and now this cell will have that piece of DNA. Okay. Okay, uh, surface coatings. Uh, we have what's called the S layer. These are thousands of copies of a single protein that are linked together. They help to provide protection from the environment condition, environmental conditions. And they're typically only produced during hostile environments. We also have what's referred to as the glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx could either be a slime layer or a capsule. And what happens is uh, these organized structures such as capsules, this is an additional layer in addition to the plasma membrane cell wall or outer membrane if the cell has that. These capsules will actually are going to play a very important role in pathogenesis as well, meaning the ability to cause disease because the capsule will actually prevent phagocytosis from occurring. Now, phagocytosis is one of our body's main defense mechanisms that we have. And by encapsulating the bacteria with a capsule, you're actually preventing your own immune system uh, or preventing the host immune system from actually being able to attack the cell. Okay, a lot of times these surface proteins with the glycocalyx uh, can be used in forming um, biofilms, okay? And a lot of times, especially with the slime layers, uh, they will sort of create this uh, external matrix in which these cells will ultimately be resuspended in. Okay, the cell envelope. Now the cell envelope is referred to as the cell wall, uh, which in bacteria is peptidoglycan. We'll talk about that in a minute again. Cytoplasmic membrane cell membrane, plasma membrane, whatever you want to call it. And then in some bacteria, specifically in your gram-negative bacteria, they will also have an outer membrane. <clears throat> and the cell envelope will act as a single protective unit. So let's talk about the gram stain. Okay, we talked about gram stain procedures in the last chapter. Um, gram stain procedure will stain bacteria into two main colors, purple and pink. The purple stained bacteria are going to be referred to as gram positive. The pink stained bacteria are going to be referred to as gram negative. Now let's talk about why that's the case. On the left hand side here we have our gram positive cell and here you can see the plasma membrane. Typical phospholipid bilayer, I'm sure you've seen this picture before with phospholipid bilayers. And then we have our cell wall here in purple. The cell wall is peptidoglycan. What happens with gram stain is when you cover the cell with gram stain, which is crystal violet, the stain will actually bind to the proteins within the cell wall. And when you go to rinse the cell, any excess stain will come off, but the cell is stained purple. If you now look and that's why it's called gram positive because it actually stains with gram stain, which is crystal violet. If you look at the gram negative cell here, we have our plasma membrane, we have our cell wall, so the peptidoglycan still exists, albeit it is much thinner, uh, but it still exists. But then we have an outer membrane. So this outer membrane is another phospholipid bilayer. It looks just like the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. And the problem is, is when you cover this with crystal violet, the stain can't penetrate this particular layer, which means it can't get to the cell wall to stain those proteins. 
And if the back, if the stain can't get there, when you rinse the cell off, what's going to happen is the stain's going to wash away. Now, why does it turn pink? Well, it turns pink because we use a counter stain, safranin, which will bind to these uh, polar heads here, okay? Uh, staining the cell pink. And the counter stain is really just so that you have some type of contrast so that you are able to see these cells, okay? Uh, so gram-positive cells will have just the cell membrane and the cell wall. Gram-negative cells will have the cell membrane, cell wall, but then they're going to have this additional third layer, the outer membrane. Okay. So the structure of the cell wall, again, is peptidoglycan. Make sure that you know bacteria. This is what composes the cell wall. Okay. Uh, and if we look at what peptidoglycan is, as I mentioned, it's proteins and sugars. If you look here, all these funny names here, alanine, glutamate, lysine, uh, glycine, if you remember from reviewing chapter two, these are all amino acids. And as hopefully one thing you glean from chapter two is that amino acids make proteins. And then these uh, six uh, carbon rings here, these are going to be sugar molecules. So proteins and sugars. Okay. Um, this slide just goes over again summarizing the gram positive and this slide goes over summarizing the gram negative cell. Now some bacteria have non-typical cell walls and non-typical means not the norm. And what happens is you still sort of have a base of a phospholipid bile, I'm sorry, you still have the base of the peptidoglycan, but one of the most common non-typical cell walls is what we call mycolic acid. And mycolic acid is a very long chain fatty acid. It's essentially a wax. It's a waxy lipid. And the mycolic acid actually will embed itself within the peptidoglycan. So now not only do you have the peptidoglycan, but you now have a lot of wax that's embedded within the peptidoglycan. And from chapter three, we talked about one of the staining techniques being uh, an acid fast stain. What happens is the acid fast stain is able to stain for this mycolic acid, this acid. And uh, that's what you're actually visualizing when you see the stain through an acid fast stain. Bacteria that are very common for this are mycobacterium, okay? And they get this name because they have this mycolic acid. A very common type of mycobacterium is mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes TB. Okay, uh, the cytoplasmic membrane. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because hopefully you know what a cytoplasmic membrane is. It is a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, it regulates transport into and out of the cell. Uh, you can have energy reactions occurring on the membrane, nutrient processing, uh, and one of the key def definitions of a selectively, one of the key definitions of the plasma membrane is that it is selectively permeable. Selectively permeable means that it can control what enters or what does not enter into or out of the cell. If you disrupt the plasma membrane, the cell will lice and die. Okay. Now, out of these two targets here, the cell wall and the cell membrane, we know that animal cells, such as human cells, have cell membranes. Co using drugs that target the cell membrane would not be a smart move because there's very little difference between your plasma membrane or cell membrane and that of a bacteria. That's why most antibiotics on the market actually target uh, the cell wall and not the cell membrane. By disrupting a cell wall, we expose the cell to osmotic stress. And by exposing the cell to osmotic stress, uh, the cell then can lice. Okay, so that um, will lead to death of the cell. Again, the reason why the cell wall makes a great drug target is because animal cells do not have cell walls. So we wouldn't see any adverse effects by using an antibiotic, which is targeting something that is part of the cell wall. Okay. Uh, internal structures. The internal environment of the cell is referred to as the uh, cytoplasm. And 
what that means is this is everything within the walls of the plasma membrane. Uh, the cytoplasm is a gelatinous solution that is contained within the cytoplasmic membrane. Uh, it is the prominent site for the cell's biochemical and enzymatic activities. It consists of 70 to 80 percent water, uh, and it's a complex mixture of sugars, amino acids, and salts. It will also contain chromatin, ribosomes, granules, and fibers that act as a cytoskeleton. Remember that bacteria are going to have these membrane-bound organelles, which are typically suspended in the cytoplasm of eukaryotes. Um, but you're not going to find any organelles present within the cytoplasm of prokaryotes. Uh, the bacterial chromosome. With the bacterial chromosome, um, uh, this is when you have, sorry, with the bacterial chromosome, um, bacteria are going to have a single circular strand of DNA. So they only have one chromosome. Uh, this is completely different than what we see in a eukaryotic cell. If you look at a human cell, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Also, in eukaryotic cells, the chromosomes will be linear. Um, in prokaryotes, it is circular. The area in which the chromosome is located within the cytoplasm or the aggregate, aggregated area is called a nucleoid. This is not a separate membrane-bound structure. This is just the area of the cytoplasm where we would find the chromosome. Okay. Any essential gene that is required for the cell to exist would be found on that chromosome. Now, plasma DNA. Plasma DNA is non-essential pieces of DNA. They will separate double-stranded, they are separate double-stranded circular pieces of DNA. They are oftentimes very small, usually a handful of genes, anywhere from two to three genes, usually under around about a thousand base pairs. What they do is they typically will confer protective traits and they are passed on from an offspring during replication, but they can also be passed from cell to cell using a sex pillus, okay? A lot of times plasma DNAs are important because they are going to contain genes that potentially could lead to things like drug resistance or virulence factors, which could uh, help the bacteria in causing disease. Now, ribosomes, these are made up of RNA, uh, and ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells will have ribosomes. Now, structurally, they are different. Bacterial ribosomes are referred to as 70S. Eukaryotic ribosomes are referred to as 80S. And these, the 70 and 80S, this is an arbitrary size designation. So for prokaryotic cells, they're made up of two subunits, a 50S subunit and a 30S subunit. Don't add these numbers together because they don't add up to 70. Uh, what's happening here is when you put these two structures together, you get a little overlap of this guy and this guy. So when you look at this thing as a whole, it's not 80, but rather it's 70, okay? Eukaryotic ribosomes are 80S and they're actually composed as we'll talk about in the next lecture, 60-40. Okay. Uh, inclusion bodies, these are the storage sites for nutrients during periods of abundance. Uh, the analogous structure in a eukaryotic cell would be a vacuole. Um, again, these inclusion bodies are not separate structures within the cytoplasm. These are just areas within the cytoplasm in which you are storing uh, various things. The cytoskeleton. Um, eukaryotic cells will also have a cytoskeleton. And this is essentially the framework of the cell. This is the skeleton of the cell. Okay, and it's typically made up of protein subunits. Uh, with the cytoskeleton of uh, prokaryotes, it's much less dynamic than that of eukaryotes, meaning that 
you're not going to really see cell shape changes in prokaryotic cells where in a eukaryotic cell you might be able to. It's a much more dynamic uh, structure. Okay, um, bacterial spores. So what are spores? Spores are going to be structures um, in which uh, the bacterial cell has decided to go into hibernation. So the spores are essentially bacterial cells that have gone into hibernation. And one of the reasons why a cell would go into sporulation is because it is induced by environmental conditions. The primary environmental condition that would induce sporulation would be lack of food. So if you think about a bear going into hibernation, it's because there's lack of food. Uh, and much goes with a lot of these bacteria that can form spores. Now it is important to note that not all bacteria are able to form spores. It is actually just a hand select that are able to. And the primary organisms that we typically see forming spores, I just want to kind of go through this real quick, is bacillus species and clostridium species. Okay. So if you see the genus of bacillus or if you see the genus of clostridium, the thing that should go off in your head is that this is a spore forming bacteria. Now, why are spores bad? because we've heard of spores before, and this is not something that is unique to just bacterial cells as well. Uh, eukaryotes, such as fungi, can also form spores. Spores tend to resist heat, drying, freezing, radiation, and chemicals. They can live on objects or inanimate objects for very long periods of time, and they are tough to kill. Okay, if anybody has any experience of having to have to work in, um, you know, a nursing home or hospital and have come across C. diff or have had to clean up after C. diff, you can't use normal disinfections for that. You have to actually use a uh, cleaner that is going to make sure that the spores are actually being killed. So what happens is, you know, uh, what will happen with the process of sporulation is you have a normally growing cell uh, for whatever reason, there is lack of nutrients, um, and what we'll, you'll start to see is the formation of a spore. As the spore forms, you will essentially develop a very tiny cell that gets rid of most of the cytoplasm. Okay, uh, you have your nuclear, you have your nuclear material, um, the DNA, the chromosome. Um, very little cytoplasm and most metabolic activities are going to shut down. And what you have is also the development of a very thick uh, coat that will form around the uh, spore. And the spore will emerge and it will stay as a spore until it lands on a nutrient rich environment where it can then start to grow uh, in a vegetative state again. Vegetative means it's actively growing. So if you look here, you can see this is the spore cell here, but it has this very, very thick uh, outer coat here, uh, which is really what helps with the resistance to um, um, the environments. As I mentioned, anytime you see the genus Bacillus or Clostridium, uh, you want to think spore forming bacteria. That's why, you know, if you get uh, a deep cut caused by an inanimate object um, or say a dog bite, because the uh, Clostridium tetani can live on the teeth of dogs, um, you know, and you go to the emergency room for stitches, the first words out of their mouth are going to be, when was your last tetanus shot? because these spores can be found on these various surfaces and it can lead to tetanus. C. diff I mentioned before. C. perfinogens is a bacteria that can cause gangrene, botulin. Uh, this is gonna cause botulism and bacillus anthracis can cause anthrax. Uh, spores are a constant intruder where sterility and cleanliness are important. They resist ordinary cleaning methods, boiling water, soaps, and disinfectants. Um, they can frequently contaminate cultures and media. Uh, 
hospitals must protect against endospores in various wounds, especially that we don't want gangrene to set in. Uh, and destruction of spores is important in the food canning industry as well because you don't want somebody to end up with botulism. Okay. Uh, so um, prokaryotic cells, again, uh, evolutionarily speaking, were one of the first uh, sort of cells to uh, develop here. Okay. And if we look at the domain of bacteria, we have our gram positive, we have our gram negatives. We have our spore producers, we have our chlamydia spirochetes, and our cyanobacteria. These are the major families of bacteria. And um, for the purposes of um, the first exam, this is where I want you guys to stop. Uh, the last couple slides here just go over medically important families of bacteria or prokaryotic cells. And these last couple slides, um, you do not need to know these for exam one, uh, again, but we will come back to these when we start talking about the uh, different types of bacterial infections in unit three. Okay, so uh, you are stopping on slide number 47 for exam one. Okay. Um, have a good day, guys.